Morning, everyone. Thank you to Marcus for leading us so well and for preaching my sermon before I get there. Um, that's, always, uh, that's always the risk. If you have a pastor who leads, you're doomed because they will preach your sermon. It's just what we do, really, isn't it? Right, you're sitting there waiting for me to deliver, so I'm going to ask you to, a question now. If you were asked to describe God with one word, what word would you use? I'm not thinking of a comprehensive word. I'm just thinking, how would you describe God? So if you saw the sentence, God is, how would you complete that sentence? God is. Holy. Holy. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Almighty. Almighty. Changeless. Sorry? Changeless. Changeless. Love, yeah, anything else? Perfect, Perfect, yes. And so we could go on. I put actually a a list of uh, ideas up there, but it is fairly random and it is certainly not complete. Turn with me to Psalm 73 because we have a summary there of what God is like. And it's in verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. It's interesting that when Moses, if you remember in the Old Testament, asked to see the face of God, God said, you cannot see my face. It's impossible for you to see my face. But I will pass by you, and what will you see? You'll see my... Anyone remember? It wasn't actually glory. You would think that, wouldn't you? What he said is, you will see my goodness. It's as though it's a summary, really, isn't it, of what God is like, his goodness. And that's how the psalm begins. And so it starts wonderfully, doesn't it, and very positively. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. If we stop there, we'd be on good ground, wouldn't we? But unfortunately, we can't because the next 11 verses raise the question, is God good to those who are pure in heart. That's why I've put my title, Is God is Good? And I've put that rather provocative question mark after it. Because the psalmist begins to question the very fact that God is good. He has doubt in his heart. He has a doubting heart. Now, many of you know that uh, once a month, I, I'm part of a, of a club called Probus. Now, I had no idea what Probus was until I came to tend to them, but Probus are just basically people who used to be in Rotary and have retired. So it's a a bunch of mostly men, I have to say, (laughs) although women are part of the, the club, but it's mostly men. All of us retired. And the thing about it is, I, I, let me just say, I enjoy it. And, and it's, it's great to have a, a bunch of men together, 60 or 70 men sometimes, all different, all different backgrounds. It's great, interesting business, uh, finding out their lives and, and talking to them. But I feel constantly the poor relation. Because most of them seem to be very wealthy. I mean... They all seem to have big cars. And they all have big holidays. So it's quite common talking to someone that they are going off on their third um, cruise. If you know anything about the cost of cruises, you know what that costs. Now, these are men and women who are on, you would say, fixed incomes. And yet... They can do all of this. Money, it appears, is no object. Let me say, just in case anyone in Probus hears this sermon, that, uh, you know, I do love the the club and I do love the people there and it's great opportunities to talk sometimes about the Lord Jesus, it has to be said. But you do feel, you know, there's sort of imbalance here. You can't help but be envious. You just can't help it, you know. You are. And this is where this man is. But the thing is, he's not just superficially envious. This man is in real depths of doubt. Read the first two and three. 
But as for me, he says, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Do you see? Here's a man who really feels envious, and he feels, um, as it were, that, that he's at a loss. He is supposedly one of the godly ones, one of the pure in heart. Yet he is envious of these people and of their prosperity and so on. He basically, he feels sorry for himself. That's where he is. And why is that? Well, he tells us the way he looks at things. Look at it. He, he says in uh, verse 9, their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Well, we're talking here of deeply God, godless people, aren't we? People who have no interest in God, no interest in the things of God, and are arrogant about it. In fact, he says that in, um, in, in verse 6. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice, with arrogance. They threaten oppression. Here's a people who are just so arrogant, and they are powerful. And you know, the problem with arrogant pride people who have power is that they crush and oppress those who aren't powerful and who have no power and so that's what is happening he's looking out on the world and he sees this oppression that's going on he takes it even further to a physical dimension they he says in verse 4 have no struggles their bodies are healthy and strong they are free from common human burdens they are not plagued by human ills now, I'm sure many of us have watched the Olympics to some degree. Personally, I find the Olympics intimidating. You see these guys, you know, incredibly fit, superb specimens of humanity, muscular, nothing is a problem. And then I make the mistake of looking at a full-length mirror and thinking to myself, this is really scary. This is really dreadful. But that's the way it is. And this is the way this man looks at it. He says, these people are just healthy and strong. They don't have the normal problem of human ills. In fact, it's quite possible that this man is feeling ill and is ill. How do I say that? Well, look at verse 14. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. Here's a man who it just suggests, doesn't he, that things are bad for him. He is ill. He is uh, sick. And so he looks at all of this, and everyone else seems to be just so great, so healthy, so happy, so wealthy, so powerful. And they're the godless ones. They're the godless ones. In fact, he sums it up in verse 12. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. And the result of him looking at these people like this is verse 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. What is the point of being a godly person? What is the point in sacrificing one's life for the Lord when this is the reward? I suffer, they prosper. What is the point? And he, he says that in verse 16. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Of course, it doesn't trouble you, does it, or me? We don't have a problem with this. We've got it all sussed, haven't we? But have we? The bottom line is, we do look out on our world, and it does seem unjust, doesn't it? I mean, travel with me into history. I mean, just think of the tyrants of this world. I mean, the 20th century, known as the murderous century. 
The 20th century had Hitler. He was never brought to justice. He shot himself. He was never put on trial. And in fact, it is a reality, which is disturbing, that the large percentage of Nazi criminals were never brought to justice. That the Nuremberg trials and that were just the icing on the cake. There was a vast number of cruel, murderous Nazis who then went on to live a normal life, raise a family, and grow into old age and be prosperous. That is the reality. They were never brought to justice. Think of Stalin. Stalin murdered, we believe, millions of his own people, let alone anyone else. And what happened to Stalin? Was he ever ju judged and seen as guilt, guilty for murder? No, he died of a massive stroke, never brought to justice. We look out on our world, we look out on our nation. What do we see? Every day we are frustrated that criminals get away with it, that people are never brought to justice, and that uh, almost, you know, the, the, they go on committing crimes. I read a statistic the other day that the awful crime of rape, that there is something like 200 rapes a year that are um, given to the, the courts, to the CPS, four ever go to court and the person found guilty. Four out of 200, out of a terrible crime like that. This is our world, isn't it? And it seems so unjust. People get away with it. What about us? Well, our lives aren't always a bed of roses. Often, far from it. Sometimes it's really difficult. Sometimes we feel that everything is against us. And we say, like this psalmist, really, I, um, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure, I've washed my hands in innocence. In other words, what's the point in being a Christian? What is the point, to put it into New Testament terms? What is the point in trying to serve the Lord Jesus when all we seem to get is all this difficulty and oppression and illness and disaster and you name it? And we say, as we look out on the world, what is God doing? Where is justice? Of course, we don't say that very often. In fact, this uh, psalmist, interestingly, says, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. He keeps it to himself, just like we do. Because you're looking lovely this morning, may I say. But that doesn't say what's going on in your heart, does it? Or in my heart. So this is the situation. But then we have a clearer perspective. Linda and I had our cruise to Keswick in the Lake District. I was a drive, really. And of course, you know the Lake District and Keswick is beautiful. You would actually think, is it beautiful? Because most of the days, the uh, surrounding countryside was covered in cloud, as it often is in this Lake District. Uh, the weather can be very changeable. And so the beautiful uh, sights that you're supposed to see, you can't really see because of the clouds. So one day when it was clear, I ran up to the highest peak that I could of the fells, you know, up on the mountain there. And I looked out on the beauty of the Lake District, which uh, you can, that's the cloud bit. You, there is a beautiful picture as well. There it is. You see there, that's the perspective of the lakes that we know, don't we? So having run up there, you now see that's beautiful, clear perspective. This is the lakes in all its beauty. If you believe any of this, then you really do not know me, okay? Um, I don't even walk up at the fell, let alone run up it. Other people do, but I don't. But that, so I stole this picture, actually. It's John Stevens photo. I just thought I'd say that. I like to name drop and he's the director of the FIC. It's his photo. A clear perspective. And this is eventually where this man gets to. And we're thankful for that. He is honest. He has got into this situation of, of when I try to understand all this, when I try to rationalize it and look at it, I, I, I'm troubled. And I'm deeply troubled. But then... There's a sudden turnaround. 
and we reach a climactic moment, a watershed in the whole of the psalm in verse 17. Till, till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. What does he do? He goes to the temple. That's what he does. He goes to the temple. As a good Jew, he goes to the temple. In other words, he goes to seek the face of God. He goes to find out, basically, what God's perspective is of these things. And it's interesting, actually, just as an aside, that it is in the temple, in the place of worship, where the light dawns, isn't it? And the only mention that is that because... Every pastor I know is struggling with the fact that in their churches, by and large, people are very casual about church, about the gathering of God's people. It's not an important thing for them. They'll come if there's nothing better to do. I'm not caning you people because you're here, but you get the message. That is the way it is at the moment. We don't know why this trend has appeared within church and uh, over the last decade or so. But it is the fact that people come and then they don't come. And they, these are faithful Christians, you would say. And there is the danger, isn't it? Because it's often here that God speaks to his people. It's often here that you're sitting there individually and God actually speaks to you. And says, this is for you. This is for you. I remember Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher, saying once that, you know, he can never understand people not being eager to be together in church. He said, because one day, God could bring revival. He could meet that church in glorious power, and you're not going to be there. You're going to miss it. It's a fact, isn't it? That's the anticipation we should have. Anyway, that's an aside, nothing to really to do with this psalm. But anyway, we've gone on to that because that's where he goes and that's where his sight, his perspective is suddenly opened up because he looks now not horizontally, but he looks vertically, not only at what God is saying and the truth of the scriptures, but into eternity. That's where his vision goes. It goes from this earth, which is difficult to understand, that seems unjust, and then he looks into eternity. And what does he discover? Surely, he says, verse 18, you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they, these godless ones, how suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. Verse 20, they're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Verse 27, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. In other words, the psalmist has now got a vision of reality in spiritual things, that there is going to be an end point in this life. There is going to be a day of meeting with Almighty God and be before his throne and be in the judgment hall. In other words, he sees that whatever is happening out there, we are all going to meet the great judge of the earth. There is judgment to come. These arrogant people, how would God know, they say? Does the Most High know anything? And the answer is, he not only knows, but he sees and he remembers. And a day will come when every deed will be judged by the Lord. There will be just justice. And justice will not only be done in heaven, but it will be seen to be done. Now, you could say that the psalmist, like a lot of psalmists, and I think the one that Dave is doing next week, suggests almost as though the psalmist is gloating over that. I don't think that for a minute. Because, like John Stott said, that um, when you preach the judgment of God and the wrath of God, which you have to do if you're going to be true to Scripture, you do it with tears in your eyes. Why? Because he, he says here, 
Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. Hitler will be judged. Make no mistake. Stalin will be judged. Make no mistake. No one will get away with it in the courts of God. He will judge justly. Judgment will be seen to be done. But when we see this, we see this is not just the tyrants of this world, how easy we can look at it like that. We see those who are closer to us. Those who don't care about the Lord. Those who live their lives without God. Who are they? They're our neighbors. They're our friends. They're my friends in Probus. They're the people we work with every day. They're our families. And so we weep for them. We not only weep for them, but if ever there's a need for us in this day and age, even for our own community here, to be on our knees, this is it. I see no hope for us unless we pray earnestly with tears for those who are dying and who are going to be ushered into this great assize of God. So this psalmist has seen something. He's looked into eternity now. But he doesn't leave it there. There's also a joyful heart. And we're glad of that, aren't we? There's a joyful heart here. But before we get to the joy, that would be very good for us to do, something else has to happen. Look at verse 21 and 22. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. He speaks honestly to the Lord. This is how I was. This is how angry I was at you, Lord. I was like a beast of the forest. And I was just horrible to you as the Lord, even though you are God. In other words, he needs to see where he'd gone. And he needs to repent. There's repentance in here. Before there's joy, there has to be repentance. And this man sees that he needs to get it straight in front of the Lord and repent for his attitude, which was so skewed. And then he moves on. I mean, the thing about his attitude, and I think we've all felt it as we read this psalm, is it's out of proportion, isn't it? It's not actually that real. These people without God aren't always healthy and they don't always prosper and, and all the rest of it. But that's what happens to us, isn't it? When we're in trouble, and particularly perhaps when we're ill, everything gets out of shape, out of perspective. We, we, things get larger, almost. And that's what's happened to this man. But now he's going to get straightened out. And he begins to see the blessing of being a child of God. Verse 23. Yet... I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. Verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 28. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Do you see the point there? He is realizing that actually whatever's happening out there, I am near to God. Or, put it better, God is near to me. There's a wonderful phrase there. I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. Isn't that lovely? We just read that. But uh, um, forgive me, Arthur, but watching Rode the other day, who is beginning to walk was held by his, her mum's hand. That's what you expect for a toddler, don't you? As they begin to walk, you know they're going to fall over on their face. What do you do? You hold their hand. They're walking, but they're held strongly by the hand. That's the image here. That the Lord God above, Almighty God, that we said, and when I asked you for descriptions, oh, there's a lectern there, um, that... Uh, you know, he holds our hand. He is near to his people. He is not at a distance. Whatever we feel, that is the reality. And he also says in verse 24, you guide me with your counsel and afterwards you will take me into 
glory. In other words, as we gather here as God's people, and as you open your Bible in the week, God is speaking. He is speaking to you and to me. His voice is heard. How is it heard? By his wonderful scriptures. That's how we know his voice. That's how we get our correct perspective when we see what God's view of things is. And we learn from his word and we believe it and trust it. There is no proof that there is going to be a day of judgment. Really, is there? Is there any proof that there's going to be a day of judgment? Not really, but we know there is because Scripture tells us there is. This psalm tells us there is. And we believe what the Word says. Do you see? And that's where this man is. He realizes the blessing he has as a child of God, if you like. In fact, what is interesting is that the first person singular is used 15 times in this sermon, in this um, psalm. What do I mean? Well, he addresses God. No, the second person singular, sorry. He addresses God, you, or your possessive pronoun, 15 times. So through this psalm, there is this intimacy. You, I'm speaking to you, almighty God, who owns this universe and controls it. I'm speaking to you, and you're listening. Wow. So he uses that word. Incidentally, for those of us who struggled with Psalm 88 last week, which seems to be interminably dark, and actually the last verse is, when darkness is my closest friend, you can't get more depressed than that. The second person singular is used 25 times. In a psalm where the psalmist seems to be a million miles from God, he's using the, the, the second person, you. He is speaking to his God who he thinks is a million miles away. Do you see? The intimacy is there. Whatever you feel, instinctively, you know that God is there. But here's the question as we come to an end. This man is an Old Testament believer. Don't you find that astonishing? He is writing and experiencing God possibly a thousand years before the advent of the Messiah. Anything he knew about the Messiah was from a distance. It was like Osa Keswick looking out on the mists, trying to penetrate what is going on out there. But we're not. We are this side of the Messiah's advent. We're this side of the cross where our redemption was wrought by the blood of the Son of God. We're this side of the empty tomb where the victim became the great victor and brought sin and death and hell to destruction. We're this side of our Lord Jesus' ascension in heaven where he now resides, what? As king of kings, as the the one uh, who controls this universe who has all, all authority. And we're this side of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God was poured out, that this psalmist would have known nothing about, or very little. We know as a daily experience that the Spirit of God has been poured out to every believer in the Lord Jesus. And he never departs from us. He is with us all the time, bringing Father and Son to us. This is our experience this is our experience now I am closing believe me Um, we may look at this and say well that's the theology that's all well and good Yeah, I, I know this I know this but what do we do when we are slipping down when we are doubting God's goodness and we are miserable when we do feel sorry for ourselves, when, when we are envious of others, what do we do? That's a question, isn't it? We need to do something. Well, my answer is this. There's a lovely moment in the closing days of the Lord Jesus on earth. And you'll know this because we preached it recently. Now, there were some Greeks. It's in John 12. 
among those who went up to worship at the festival. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And that's it. That is the key. Why? Because this man, to begin with, is absorbed with everything out there. And he can't understand it. And neither can we. We don't know why we suffer. We don't know why they are getting away with it and we're not. We've got no idea. And God doesn't always tell us. But this, these men wanted to see Jesus. And it seems to me that we have a choice in the midst of our difficulties. We either look at the difficulties and the contradictions and the disappointments and absorb ourselves with those, which is the temptation, is it not? Or we turn our face to Jesus and we look to him and we fill our sight with his beauty and his goodness and his mercy. When I first became a Christian, everybody sang choruses. We don't do it very much now, but we sang choruses. And some of them weren't worth singing, to be honest. But some were good because in the kernel of them was, was truth. And I wonder how many of you sang the chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Come on, look full in his wonderful face. And what happens? The things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That's it, isn't it? That's our hope. That's where our strength and faith and help come from. The night he was betrayed, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because he neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And in verse 23 of chapter 14 of John's Gospel are the most profound words that we could come across anywhere. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. The Father and the Son through the Spirit lives in every believer, whoever we are, whatever we're experiencing, whatever we feel, that is the reality. 